Hey everyone, welcome to your supplementary lecture on adolescence. This will cover anything that we didn't get to in class. At the end of this, you'll have your full lecture on adulthood. In class, we talked about what makes you independent, what leads you into adulthood, and whether or not this transition is really the same for everyone. And the answer is no. It's changed over time and from culture to culture and based on your socioeconomic status, it can be unique to different pockets of people. If we talk about time, well, back in the 1890s, adolescence was a much shorter period for women, starting with when you first got your period, probably closer to your 15th birthday, and ending when you got married, probably closer to your 22nd birthday. Today, it's a much larger period with increased nutrition, better health. That period has extended with periods actually happening a couple years earlier, somewhere between 12 and 13. But then we look at age of marriage, and while that isn't a biological process, that's a social constructed process, that's pushed even later, closer to around the age of 25. Does this hold true for males as well? Well, on the social end, yes, very much so. Men are getting married later as well. So that period of emerging independence, well, that's a different time frame now. Adolescence is extended. It goes from puberty until maybe the end of formal education, possibly college. Depending on the economy at the time, it might be kind of a weird transitional adulthood period all the way until you move out of your parents' home. Usually this is considered a time of rebellion and confusion, or at least that's the myth. When we talk about adolescence, it's a time of self-discovery. It's a time of figuring out what you want with your life, who you're going to become, what skills you're going to refine, and understanding that you are a separate individual from the people that have raised you. It can be a transitional time with minimal disruptions, but anytime you break from the nest, anytime that you solidify who you are as a person, you might find out that you don't always agree with everybody. As a homework assignment, you guys read Myth 7, or hopefully you read Myth 7, and that should dispel this entire idea that being a teenager means fighting and anger all the time. Puberty is that time of sexual maturation. It's the time where you're able to reproduce, and it marks the start of adolescence. Now, the interesting thing with the increase of hormones that you're going to have is that those hormones start before any of the actual observable physical changes. Shifts in sleep schedules, sleeping later into the morning than you maybe have done before, maybe a little bit more of a dysregulation of emotions. And this is happening in elementary school, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, way before any of the physical changes become truly evident. Girls right around 11, boys a little bit closer to 13. It also is accompanied by a growth spurt. So most girls, by the time they leave middle school, have reached their full adult height. But for boys, that might be closer to somewhere around your sophomore year of high school. You start to develop your primary and secondary sex characteristics. Primary are the first, or let's in this case, instead of say first, think most important. Your primary sex characteristics, they allow you to reproduce. So that's going to be the stimulation of the release of ovum for women. Uh, for males, it'll be the production of sperm. Secondary sex characteristics, well, those are the ones that usually allow us to identify gender. So for women, it'll be the increase in fatty deposits on your hips and your breasts. And for males, it's going to be increased body hair and a deeper voice. We spoke briefly about the growth spurts. I am 17 months younger than my older brother. And there was a short window where I was actually taller than him. And I love that time period because he didn't push me around as much. But as you can see in this chart, boys tend to outpace girls on average. There's a short spurt for girls. And again, that's in those middle school years where you may have been the really tall girl. And then by the time you get to roughly about 14 or 15, boys start to have their growth spurts and on average are going to be taller than most girls. Sexuality is definitely governed by biology but also cultural experience. Now, looking at your textbook and some of the facts that you can pull from it, in a typical hour of primetime television, you have 15 sexual references made. But that's talking about NBC, CBS, ABC. This didn't go into the Netflix, the Hulu, the HBO of it all, which can be a lot more. 
most of those shows ignore things that might lead to unwanted pregnancies or STDs. We don't necessarily always give out the best messages. And there are mixed messages out there, abstinence versus safe sex um, versus what the television tells you what versus what your peers tell you. Ultimately, as uncomfortable as it may sound, your best source for most of this information should be your parents. Talk to them, have an open dialogue. Often no discussion is ever talked about, but even more so, the emotional risks that come with all of this are usually avoided. And that's where we can see some real psychological damage. When we talk about orientation, approximately three to 4% of men are going to be considered exclusively homosexual. In other words, they have no interest in women. Approximately one to 2% of females consider themselves exclusively homosexual with no interest in men. And approximately 1% of people are considered bisexual. Now, this is kind of hard because all I can tell you is that according to the research that collected this data, there's been research done repeatedly that showed these numbers do kind of transition and shift a bit, but they don't shift greatly. They're usually in the single digits and relatively low. In 2007, Robert Epstein researched the sexual orientation continuum. This was actually a continuation of research that was done by Kinsey back in the 1940s, later further researched by Masters and Johnsons in the 1960s into the 70s, and now we have Epstein. Well, when we look at sexual orientation continuum, there is societal pressure on that kind of continuum, which has changed in the last decade. Exclusive same-sex attraction tends to be rather low, where exclusive opposite attraction seems to be much higher. Now, from a biological standpoint, this makes sense if you want to continue a species. The societal pressure, however, that's a much deeper, much more developed issue to talk about. When we talk about sexual orientation, we're going to talk about the two ends of the sexual orientation continuum. Now, I understand that the world that we live in today, the conversations of LGBTQ plus communities are much more varied and don't just focus on homosexuality and heterosexuality. But for the purposes of this course and with the research that we have available to us, we are going to look at research based information, which limits us right now to the discussion about homosexuality and heterosexuality. Homosexuality, according to your textbook and research that we have, is not caused by parenting styles. Overly harsh or overly lenient parents don't create an orientation in their child. Hatred or fear that is expressed to a child, taught to a child, or forced upon a child doesn't cause an orientation. When we look at being or who we are raised by, we have children who are homosexual raised by heterosexual parents, and we have children who are heterosexual raised by homosexual parents. Being raised by homosexual parents doesn't influence your orientation. And when we look at exploitation, and in this case, we're talking about abuse, that doesn't cause an orientation either. Looking at the research and what can possibly cause this, well, we do see same-sex behavior in other species. We also have been able to genetically manipulate the orientation of other animals, specifically in sheep and fruit flies, by adjusting their genetics and causing same-sex behaviors. So with that research, we come from a kind of understanding that there can be a genetic manipulation or a genetic component to this. Mothers who have several sons, it becomes more common that uh, homosexual males are the youngest son or down the line of several sons. And they think that this might be due to a lack of testosterone during the pregnancy. But this was also shown when they did research with sheep and they either increase the testosterone or decrease the testosterone in the pregnancy. And what they found was that with female births, the increase in testosterone showed that they acted more male-like. And if they decrease the testosterone in the male births, well, you saw more of that male homosexual behavior in the sheep. Again, these are not always absolutes, but we're seeing this in research. The one thing that we also see is that there is an area called the anterior commissurate of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a structure in your brain that influences your sexual desire, your sexual motivation. Well, in gay men, the anterior commissurate on a MRI or a CAT scan, or more specifically an MRI, especially an fMRI when we're looking at the functionality of this area of the brain, activates the same way it does in a female brain. And it doesn't activate the way it does in a heterosexual male's brain. So there is some research out there. 
If you would like to look at what we just spoke about in a little more detail, please reference your textbook. Now, we're back to Piaget, and we talked about Piaget in early childhood, and we talked about his four stages. You, being an adolescent, are in the fourth stage, formal operational, which means that you're acquiring adult thought, thinking, reasoning, hypothetical thought. Essentially, what you're doing at this stage is understanding that any single problem usually has multiple causes, and that any solution to a single problem might not just be a single solution. Abstract, hypothetical reasoning, formal logic. At this point, we start to see kids take on what ifs. Things like algebra start to make a little bit more sense, putting a letter in for a number, and looking at maybe cause and effect, trying to figure out what will happen before it happens. You will have an intellectual growth spurt, and you're going to understand and start to develop more capabilities. In fact, you have a neural reorganization during this time period, streamlining you for what you do best. But what you do best will be determined by what you put your effort into. You should be focused on you. And you start learning about planning, impulse control. All of these things are still immature, and you're trying to myelinate that prefrontal cortex so it fires more efficiently and quickly like an adult brain. So let's practice with your formal operational thought. You have a scenario. A man goes to a family reunion and is encountered by three women, one of which is his long lost sister. You have to figure out which one it is. I am your long lost sister, says Amy. She's lying. I'm your long lost sister, Barbara insists at the family reunion. At least two of us always lie, smirks a third woman, Carol. Which one is the man's sister? Pause the video right here if you don't want me to give you the answer. All right, now I'll give you the answer. So you have to make a couple of assumptions. You can assume that Amy is lying or she's telling the truth, but it doesn't get you anywhere. You can assume that Barbara's lying or telling the truth, and yet that still doesn't get you anywhere. Then you get to Carol. Carol says at least two of us always lie. So if Carol is telling the truth, and she has to be because you know that there is only one missing sibling, and that two of them must lie, then what Carol has just said is the truth, which then discounts her as a liar. In that case, that leaves two other people to be the liars, which would be Amy and Barbara, and therefore Carol has to be the sister. With adolescence, children start to reach a state of independence, and there's a natural separation. In fact, it's kind of built into us. And there may be an increase in arguments or miscommunication or misperception of intent, and that happens. But if you look at the chart that is over to your right-hand side, here you see positive or percentage of positive warm interactions with parents. And two to four, it's really high, like at 80%, and then it steadily goes down. And does that mean that parents don't have the same level of positive warm interactions? Well, in this study, they were looking at things like embraces, snuggles, um, telling the kid that they're just wonderful for wonderfulness sake. And the reality is, is that as you get older, it would be weird if your parents tried to pick you up or snuggle you like they did when you were two. I don't grab my 10 year old son and put him in my lap and sit there and bounce him on my knee. That's just weird. And if he were 16, that would be really weird. So as you get older, there's that natural separation, not just by size, but also by the idea that you don't need the same kind of coddling. And if you think about the positive warm interactions, it has to be with meaning. It can't just be these kind of, you drew a scribble on a paper and oh, that's the most amazing thing. So it becomes a little bit different. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to see the value and the depth in the interactions, but also move towards your peers, move towards other people that can give you a different sense of warm interactions. When we talk about development, it occurs both in stages, so that maturation or those age-related. It's also continuous and hard to kind of pinpoint a single spot, and that often is with cognition and emotional development. Adolescence is definitely a time of stability. You start to firmly entrench yourself in your value systems, your beliefs, your temperament is relatively stable. And it's a time for change. You change friendships, relationships, um, your interactions with your family start to evolve into something new, and you might start to streamline certain behaviors. Nature guides the genetically predetermined sequences of change, like puberty. 
But nurture teaches us what our society expects from us, the rules, the expectations, where we're supposed to go in the next stage of our life. And this will lead us into the next topic, which is adult. This starts your full lecture on adulthood. Adulthood we didn't have time to really discuss, and there's really only a couple of very key things that you're going to see on your test, which is why you're getting this in audio form. There's an idea that we have that is called a social clock, essentially your society's best timing for life events. When you should, I don't know, get married, start having kids, retire from work. All of those are pretty much predetermined by a society. And you know that you have stepped outside of your society's predetermined social clock when people raise an eyebrow, look at you weird, or ask why you're not married when you're 27 years old. And I only use that as an example because I got married when I was 29. Here we're looking at some data coming from the 2010 census. And please understand that it's coming from the 2010 because it is now 2020 and we are compiling the census. But looking at just the difference between 2010 and 1980, so a 30 year span, there has been a three year increase in the age at which men get married and there's been a four year increase in the age at which women get married and a two year increase at the age of first childbirth. Now, when we're looking at that, that doesn't seem huge, but for a society, that's showing us a trend. And what that often is tied into is schooling, socioeconomic status, to become financially independent, to have the certification, whether it's going to a Votech school or going to college, it requires that you get further education past high school. We're seeing a shift in a lot of these ages and more women are going to college than ever before. So it does make sense that women might be waiting until they get solidified in a career past the age of 22, which is usually right around the time where you would graduate from college before they choose to invest their time in a marriage. Age of first marriage by state in 2005. And what you might see is that a lot of the states that are in the pinks and the reds tend to not have really huge cities associated with them. Now, I understand Texas has a lot, but Texas also has a lot of open space. When you get into highly metropolitan and highly um, populated areas, you're going to see that there is often a shift in age of marriage. And so something like Virginia, we're still somewhere around 25 to 26. But if you get closer to the Maryland, D.C. area, which is where we technically live, you're looking at 27 to 28. And again, it just has to do with what people are doing within those regions. 18 to your mid twenties is a time that we are now relabeling as emerging adulthood. Some people will still say that you're a kid. It's still kind of an adolescence period, but really what emerging adulthood is, is it's a time where you have moved past truly your adolescence. You're starting to experience a bit more independence, but you still have a little bit of reliance on your parents. Midlife is from about 36 to 64. So going on 42, I don't necessarily feel like I'm middle-aged, but the truth is, yes, I am. I'm in the middle of my life. So when we look at something like youth, a lot of the things that get focused on in our society are youth-based. And if we were in class, I would say, think of all the ways that we market towards younger people. And then I would start showing you things like this. Why be gray when you can be yourself? Ooh. Turn back the clock. <laughs> Where doctors check their bags and you're getting, you know, dermatology centers. Give mature skin the extra care it deserves. Now that's supposed to be a woman that we assume is probably in her 60s and she looks fantastic. There are physical changes that happen. The over focus on youth can be somewhat destructive, um, more on an emotional sense to men and women. For women, the physical changes that happen as we get older, well, the big one is menopause. Uh, the body stops menstruating, which you would think like people on television all seem sad about this. Ask any woman the idea that you're not going to have your period anymore. That's going to be amazing. About 2% of women actually experience regret at this. That means 98% of us are doing our happy dance and we'll take a hot flash if it means no longer having a period. This usually occurs between the ages of 45 and 55. And again, that has to do with the fact that that's usually the period where you are no longer having viable births. So yeah, most women aren't depressed or irrational during this. It's kind of just uncomfortable. 
Men, on the other hand, don't really have an equivalent to menopause, but their testosterone levels do drop. Um, sperm count will decline. And midlife crises are usually overblown on television. Usually we talk about these as a midlife realignment. In other words, a guy in his 50s might sit there and go, all right, well, I've done 20 or 30 years in this career field, and I'm probably going to be able to pull a pension here in a little bit. What else would I like to do with my life? What have I done and what can I do? Maybe I'd like to spend more time with my family. Maybe I'd like to pick up a hobby. But very rarely are they going to dye their hair black, get a sports car, and run off with the nanny. As we get older, there are our peak years and our less optimal years, and that's for all physical things. So let's start with vision. You're probably in your peak condition for vision in your 20s, and then once you hit 30, you notice that the line just kind of starts to dive down a bit. And that's not horrible. We know that as we get older, our vision is going to get a little weaker. It's really not until we hit our 70s that vision really does kind of this steep dive and you see an increasingly strong kind of drop off in visual acuity. Changes in smell. So we don't really think about this, but again, your sense of smell is best, strangely enough, during your childbearing years. So you can smell a poopy diaper. But in your teens and in your 20s, up until about your 30s again, your sense of smell should be on point. And then somewhere right around your 60s into your 70s, your sense of smell starts to decline. If you look at sensory interaction, that may explain why your grandparents, when they're in their 60s, their 70s, and later start to over-season their food. Hearing. Well, we spoke about hearing, and this really depends on how much you have damaged your hearing in your youth. You guys, and I do mean all of you, who wear your earbuds or you have earbuds directly put into your, your ears may have actually prematurely damaged your hearing. So this might not be the best representation, but for people who don't damage their hearing, peak hearing in your 30s and kind of into your 40s-ish, and then you start to see that that starts to decline, you're still at 90% proficiency in your 50s. But when you hit your 60s and 70s, those hearing, that hearing kind of breaks off, and that's why you're going to see older people with hearing aids. Or in some cases, if they refuse to get a hearing aid, they turn up the audio on their televisions to an insane level where you can actually tell what they're watching from like miles away. Those physical changes in hearing, what we do know is that we lose our hearing or the intensity for the really high-pitched tones first, which is why if I'm sitting in a living room with my father-in-law who is in his 70s, he has a hard time picking up female voices because our voices register at a higher pitch. As we age, you are not guaranteed to develop Alzheimer's disease. It's really important that you guys understand this. Alzheimer's disease is a disease. It isn't just the next stage in adulthood. So when we talk about it, it is a neurodegenerative disease, neurodegeneration. It actually attacks the neurons in your brain. You get these things called amyloid plaques. Amyloid plaque is produced all the time in our brain, but normally we can shuttle it out. And it starts to cause what we call neural fibrily tangles. These tangles literally end up being at the synapses and you can't get rid of the kind of gunk, the amyloid plaque, and so the neurons don't fire properly. And the neurotransmitter that usually takes a really strong role in memory and in motor coordination and in shuttling some of this stuff out is acetylcholine. And we start to have a decrease in acetylcholine. Most people think of Alzheimer's as simply forgetting the really kind of sad thing with Alzheimer's disease, it also has a lot to do with physical functioning. It starts out as memory, but eventually you become bedridden and your body no longer functions. 3% of the world's population developed this by age 75. 3%. So it is not a guarantee that you will get it. We've identified genes that are related to a familial form of this. So if it's very common in your family, you might want to see if that's something you can look into. There's no cure, but we are finding treatments and drug therapies, and we're getting better and better at it. There was a projected hope that we would have a cure by 2025. 
we're still working on it, but there's been some really cool research. Um, in Australia, they were able to use um, ultrasound to break up the amyloid plaque in mice and their bodies then naturally shuttled out that amyloid plaque and they actually showed a decrease in the symptomology for Alzheimer's disease. Most common cause of death for people with Alzheimer's disease is infection. And that's because as the brain starts to not function properly, it impacts all of your systems to include your immune system. Senile dementia, this is different than Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a specific disease. Dementia is what we would call an umbrella term. It's a term for a collection of things that, that can be caused by a whole host of things. So this can be your inability to function or think normally or maintain emotional control because you've damaged your brain from alcohol. You have a tumor on the brain. You've had a very massive stroke. But again, senile dementia is different than Alzheimer's disease. People with dementia will have impaired intellectual functioning. They are going to have sometimes with issues with emotional control, uh, behavioral problems. Uh, they might have agitation, delusions, and hallucinations. Alzheimer's disease doesn't have the delusions and hallucinations. Memory loss is common, but you can have dementia without memory loss. So just understand that dementia and Alzheimer's disease are actually separate things. Here's another kind of more hopeful chart. Notice that this is going from zero to 10%. Roughly a minimal amount of the population at 60 to 64 shows any kind of senile dementia. Maybe closer to about 4% at 70 to 74, a little bit closer to maybe about 7% at 75 to 79, maybe 10% when you get to 80. And then yes, it does increase rather drastically. But even if you're getting to 90 to 95, less than half of the population will have senile dementia. So it's not an absolute. There's plenty of people who have grandparents or have known people that lived into their hundreds that were sharp and very, very intelligent and showed no signs of any dementia. Memory is a neurological skill. It's also stuff that's kind of firmly entrenched in your brain. Adolescents, you guys have better recall for memory tasks without the need for clues, actually better than any other age group. Recognition versus recall. When we look at recognition, your ability to see something and know that you've seen it before, well, that's stable from 20 to 60. I like to play a game, well, actually, I hate this game. My husband loves this game. He'll put a song on the radio and he'll, will, as a family, try to guess the artist and the name of the song quickly. My daughter is insane at this. Usually within the first two beats of a song, she can do it. I could listen to the entire song and I don't get it until I get to the chorus, but I know I've heard it before. And that's that difference. She has really quick recall for the facts where I can recognize it, but I really am awful at that game. Older adults retain the ability to remember meaningful material, but we lose the necessary skills to remember meaningless information. So the more entrenched something is, the easier it is to recall. But if it's something like your neighbor's child's new grandkid's puppy's name, chances are you just don't remember that. But really, I mean, who needs that information? Anything that would be habitual can start to become a little more challenging. And when we're talking about adulthood, we're talking about later adulthood. So you may find that your grandparents keep calendars or um, constantly hold on to those um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday pill organizers because they don't remember exactly if they did or did not take their medication. And again, these are all average tendencies. They don't hold true for every individual. Um, my dad is going to be 70 and he's quick as or sharp as a tack. I, he's quick. I, I don't really see these happening with him. But then again, I'm his kid and I might not want to see them. But again, also average tendencies, not always true for everybody. Here, when we're looking at age and memory, number of words recognized is stable with age, but number of words recalled declines. And this is after giving somebody a memory task. Give them a list of words, see what they remember, see what they can recognize. If you don't give them the list back to kind of circle the words that they remember seeing, the recall declines. And it's just a function of age, but recognition, still pretty stable. Two types of intelligence that you guys need, and I definitely included questions about this on the test, fluid intelligent. We always talk about this as your ability to speedily and abstractly solve a problem. When we talk about quick and with abstract reasoning, 
that means that you go outside the box. You try things. You can use this way of thinking to solve novel, novel problems. And it declines. It doesn't get rid of or stop, but it's not as efficient as you get older. In your 20s and 30s, you're going to see most scientists and mathematicians make their landmark discoveries because they're thinking outside the box. They're more likely to take on a different mindset, a different way of thinking. And it's not that we become entrenched. It's just that that fluid ability becomes less fluid. Think of a raging river becoming more of a stream. When we're talking about this, I always like to use the example of how my mom hates switching phones. She doesn't like going from an Android to a Apple phone. And her thing is she doesn't know how to use it. She, she wants someone to run her through how to operate it, how to turn it on. If I gave you guys not an Android, not an iPhone, but just, I don't know, let's make up a brand new phone format. The majority of you wouldn't ask for an instructional manual. The majority of you wouldn't even care if there was one in the box. You would pick up that piece of technology and you would just figure it out. That's what we're talking about with fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence, however, is accumulated knowledge, usually talking about history and verbal skills. And these are the things that stay like a crystal, hard and solid throughout your lifetime. As you get older, your crystallized knowledge increases. Your vocabulary becomes larger, more developed. Your understanding of the world around you, history, politics becomes larger and more developed, you take with you all those stories and all that information that you've accumulated over a lifetime. When we talk about social changes and transitions, well, usually we're working towards work. So you guys are getting ready to declare a major and after that, you are probably going to change your major. In fact, most college students do. I went to college as a forensic chemistry major and realized I hated forensic chemistry. It was not what I thought it was. So I skipped over to psychology and criminal justice and got two degrees instead of one. Change careers after entering the workforce. Well, I was a police officer for seven years and I was really good at it and I liked it. But the rest of life told me that maybe that wasn't the right career for having the family that I wanted. So I became a teacher. Post-college employment is often unrelated to the college major. Yeah, well, I don't know. That kind of doesn't hold true. I got a degree in criminal justice and was a cop. I have a degree in psychology and I teach psychology. And yeah, so mine luckily works. But my husband has a degree in ornithology, which is the study of birds. And he's the head of the SWAT team and uh, a police sergeant. So not a, a whole lot of bird research done in that job. Stay-at-home moms versus work, well, it depends on the quality of what you're doing and the experience that you're having. You can be, and I have a sister-in-law who is a stay-at-home mom who the amount of work that woman does is crazy. She volunteers. She's in the schools. She's, she's not a stay-at-home mom. She's a full-time working person without a formalized title. And going to work, well, that's just a different choice that comes with its own host of issues. So it depends on whether or not the experience is good. We look at love and marriage. Great, this kind of slid off the page. Um, love lasts longer and is more satisfying if, well, if we look at love and marriage, that other major social change that we look for, and maybe not everybody, but the majority of people, well, the more you're open, the more you share with somebody, and the more that they share back openly, the closer the relationship. Uh, shared emotional support, being there for people in the hard time, similar interests and values. People who usually meet my husband aren't surprised that we're married because they literally within the first five minutes say that they get it. 90% of the population gets married at least once and marriage is more likely to last if both members are over the age of 20, have a stable income, have dated for a long time prior to marriage and have similar life goals. So yeah, make sure you get to know people before you decide to get married. We're talking about marriage, so with marriage comes the conversation of divorce. Uh, about 50% of marriages in the United States end in divorce, but of those people who get divorced, 75% of them are willing to try again. And the question we ask is why? Well, married men and women report greater happiness than unmarried or separated or divorced individuals. And it might just be having that person to share things with. You share the good, but you also get to share the bad, the stressful, the tiring, the exhausting, all of that. 
best indicator of marital success is more positive than negative interactions. So this is something you can work at. If you're waiting for that other person to make you happy, maybe you work on having good interactions and trying to make them happy as well. It's definitely a two-way street. And children, you guys can affect marital happiness. So where the workload load is shared more evenly, usually it's a more satisfying and successful marriage. And it's usually going to have better parent-child relationships because both parents are invested in the kids. Now, however you find that balance is going to be unique. You may have a somewhat traditional family where, I don't know, mom does more of the housekeeping and dad does more of the yard work, but as long as they're both working towards the same goal openly and sharing those responsibilities and what it means to be around the children, it's usually a little bit better. With Friendship and Marriage, John Gottman did a 14-year study of 650 couples, and he said the most important factor was friendship. Mutual respect for and enjoying the other person's company, knowing what the person likes or dislikes, uh, a regard for the other person, um, and you're expressing a fondness in big and little ways. It's that last one that I like, because I think we all know that it's great to be married to a person that you consider your friend. Now, when people hear me talk about my husband, I love my husband. I think he's hot. He's still super cute to me. Um, we love goofing around. We have very similar senses of humor, but it's little things. For me, he could buy me, I don't know, a new car, a diamond ring, lots of flowers. And I mean, it would be great, but you know, those are things. But in 16 years, he has always left me a note in the morning if he's the first one to leave the house. And sometimes there are little notes that just say, took care of the dogs. I hope you have a good day. I love you. And on certain days, they can be really thoughtful, more developed notes. But it's the fact that he takes a minute every morning to leave me a note that means the world to me. And when it comes to finding ways to show him that I'm fond of him, I tell him, things all the time, but I also try to do weird things like clean the garage for him or mow the lawn before he gets home. So it's not always in those big kind of financial expressions of love. Sometimes it really is just those little tiny things that just make that person recognize how lucky they are. Anger and arguments are not the most destructive emotion in a marriage. Um, when we're looking at what can be truly destructive, we're talking about literally anything that would break a normal friendship. So jealousy, secretiveness, not just anger, because anger and arguments you can work through. Eventually in life, we're going to get to a point where if you have children, you're going to be an empty nester. They should hopefully move out and often brings more happiness than sadness. Yes, you heard that correct. Not more sadness than happiness. Um, by the time you have reached 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, your parents are ready. They're ready for you to launch into your own life, to, to make your own connections, to, to do whatever it is that you're going to do. But here's the crazy thing. Once you're out of the house and you can enjoy this knowledge, your parents may actually experience a post-launch honeymoon. So just imagine what everyone thinks of as far as a honeymoon. Now imagine you're out of the house, your siblings are out of the house, and now it's honeymoon time again for your parents. When we look at overall life satisfaction, most studies show that elderly people are happy and satisfied with life. People tend to mellow out with age and most regrets focus on what a person didn't do rather than the mistakes that they have made in their life. So we accept that we're gonna make mistakes, but usually we look back and think of the opportunities that we've missed. So what I would say to you guys, if you have an opportunity and it's something you can do and it seems like something that would be good, jump at opportunities while you're young. Don't get to the end of your life and worry about what you didn't do. When we look at life satisfaction, just here's another graph of representation. As we get older, most people are pretty satisfied with life. Last couple of things that we talk about are death and dying. Women still tend to outlive men. Unexpected death is often met with grief and depression, and that can last for years. Reactions to death nowadays, well, it's different. Sometimes people believe that it should be a very solemn and modest occasion with a stiff upper lip. Some people believe that you should be able to openly wail and cry and express your grief. 
Um, those who experience extreme grief don't necessarily get it out of their system. In other words, it, it can stay with you for quite some time. Um, and there is no real predictable stage of reactions to death. So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was a researcher who said there were five stages to death and dying. And the problem with her research is that there's no predictable order and no definitive stages. Thinking about death, is it better to live with the time you have and forget how it ends? Or does the acceptance of the inevitable of death give life meaning? I don't know. I mean... It really, really does depend on how or what perspective you want to use. But people think about death nowadays, and we have a much more open culture that talks about it. And our new philosophy really towards death and dying is to make people as comfortable and keep them in the most familiar of environments as we can as they move towards that kind of final transition. So hospice care is something that has not always been around. Uh, it used to be that people would go to a hospital and be surrounded by monitors or machines or a nursing home or something like that. And if we can let people stay in their homes surrounded by family, friends, and the things that they, they like or are familiar with, we tend to do that. 